Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation. My name is Chris Prosser, and this presentation is co-authored with John Mellon and Jack Bailey from the University of Manchester. So today I'm going to be talking about the relationship between personality traits and political attitudes, and in particular the relationship between uh, one personality trait, uh, dispositional openness, and its relationship to political liberalism. So as many of you probably know, uh, there's a large literature that has developed which examines the relationship between personality traits, and particularly personality traits as measured by the, the five-factor or, or big five model of personality, and polit uh, political attitudes and behaviour. And there have been two very consistent findings in this literature. The first is that people who are high on openness are more likely to be politically liberal. And the second is that people who are high on conscientiousness are more likely to be politically conservative. And these two things have been found in, in many different studies across many different countries. So it looks like this is a fairly um, robust finding that, that kind of travels across um, different places and, and in different times. And it kind of makes theoretical um, sense. So if, if personality traits are these uh, broad, stable dispositions that affect how people um, respond to the world, then it makes sense that uh, they will also uh, affect how people respond to the political world, right? And so if openness is this uh, kind of characteristic that's supposed to capture uh, things like cognitive flexibility and preferences for um, variety, then it's maybe not surprising uh, that people who are high on, on openness are more likely to, to be politically liberal, particularly if you kind of buy into the uh, rigidity of the right model of political conservatism, which argues that um, conservatives are, are more likely to uh, be kind of resistant to um, cognitive flexibility uh, and to prefer, prefer sort of um, known things over novelty and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and likewise, uh, it's not hard to see the kind of link between conscientiousness and, and, and conservatism. So people who are high on conscientiousness are, are kind of supposed to be um, predisposed towards preferring um, kind of order and um, uh, tidiness, self-discipline. Uh, they like kind of um, fulfilling duties and, and, and so on and, and, and so forth. So this is uh, kind of both a sort of uh, a regular empirical finding and it's also one that has a, a certain theoretical plausibility to it. But as you may have guessed from uh, the title, uh, we think that there's a, a potential problem with previous studies, namely that they have inadequately controlled for potentially um, confounding uh, variables, and particularly confounding variables that are, are kind of related to social context. So um, things like social class, um, kind of uh, other ideas from sociology, things like cultural capital and, and, and status and, and, and these sorts of things. And we think that it's, it's quite plausible that rather than there being a, a causal relationship between uh, openness as a, a personality trait and political liberalism, rather that both of these things um, kind of derive from uh, some common omitted variable. And, and particularly, we think it's likely to be um, something uh, like class, although you know exactly how we define class is, is obviously uh, very difficult. But it's not hard to see that uh, empirically, there is a very strong relationship between uh, the openness personality trait and class. So if we look at some data from the Understanding Society uh, uh, panel in the UK, uh, we can see indeed that people who are a working class, according to a kind of occupational measure of class, are indeed more likely to be lower on openness, and people who are middle class are more likely uh, to be higher on openness. And there are some uh, kind of shallower gradients uh, for the other personality traits as well, uh, but uh, this is the one um, that uh, stands out. Now, there could be lots of different reasons why uh, there is this relationship. So it could be um, a process of, of, of social sorting, um, or it, it could be um, a kind of uh, confounding relationship, which is obviously the one um, that we're suggesting. So how would this confounding relationship kind of um, mess with our, our kind of previous estimates of how uh, personality relates to political liberalism. Well, to give you a kind of uh, simplified example, when we are kind of estimating um, the sort of effect of, of, of things like traits, so things that vary by individuals, what we're generally doing is we're taking uh, kind of cross-sectional survey data, so we have a bunch of individuals, 
who we measure on a particular trait and uh, then we measure them on some particular outcome so you know political attitudes and we regress one thing on the other and we find that people who are um, high on a trait are, are high on some other particular outcome or, or low on some other particular outcome so you know a sort of fairly standard um, cross-sectional um, uh, sort of statistical approach but if uh, people are kind of uh, situated in particular contexts and we know people are situated in particular contexts and if these contexts have a causal relationship on um, both of these uh, variables uh, then we're not going to be able to estimate the uh, causal effect of this trait on our outcome variable unless we control for the context. So one uh, solution to this problem is obviously to measure uh, the contextual variables and to uh, kind of adequately control for them in a, in a kind of straightforward observed fashion and um, if we can do this then obviously that's great that's what we should do we should control um, for these contextual factors um, but sometimes we're not able to do this either because uh, people didn't ask the right questions in the survey when it was done at the time um, or we simply might not be able to measure uh, these things so some of the things we think are important so things like uh, class are, are a very amorphous concept and um, although we get towards it with things like occupational um, measures or self-identification in particular classes, uh, these kind of uh, observed measures are much cruder than the kind of uh, complicated um, mesh of uh, kind of uh, economic and cultural factors that make up um, social class. And so we might not actually be adequately able to measure it even if we have variables uh, that are supposed to be measuring these things. And if we can't uh, measure these things, uh, this is often uh, a kind of very difficult thing to deal with. But there is one way that we think uh, is particularly uh, useful for dealing with these sorts of things. And that, if we, that is if we measure more than one person who shares the same context. So if we have two people who we measure our traits and our outcomes on, but they have the same uh, kind of confounding contextual variable, then it's relatively easy uh, to uh, control for this context because we can uh, take out the sort of shared uh, variance that both of these people have uh, with uh, some sort of fixed effect. And so that is uh, what we are, are going to be doing um, in this paper. And uh, we're kind of combining both the, the measured and, and unmeasured approaches. So we're also um, measured for uh, confounding variables like age, sex, and, and the interaction between age and sex, uh, because we can be fairly certain that um, the kind of causal relationship between uh, these uh, demographic variables and, and uh, personality and, and political attitudes is, is not going in the opposite direction. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we're going to measure the, uh, or, or not measure, we're going to uh, deal with the unmeasured confounding contextual variables by using household fixed effects. So basically, um, without going into these equations um, in too much, we have uh, a kind of naive model, which is a fairly straightforward uh, linear regression model uh, in which we kind of have our trait and then we have our, our control variables um, and then all we do when we add uh, the household fixed effects model is it's the same model as above and then we just add a, uh, a fixed effects that is shared between people who have uh, the same uh, social context and in order to do this we uh, need a particular type of survey data namely household panel survey data so if you're not familiar with household panel survey data it's basically where instead of uh, an individual person being sampled into a survey uh, we uh, sample entire households and then everyone in that household takes the same um, survey and so uh, we know those people who live together share that particular social um, context and we also measure them on, on all the uh, variables that we're interested in and so in each of these models uh, we're just looking at the, the same set of respondents in both the naive model and, and the household fixed effects model so uh, we're kind of dropping people who live by themselves or for whom we only have uh, one uh, kind of person in a, in a particular household uh, and so forth so the only difference between the, the results you'll see um, later is uh, this household fixed effect it's got the same people in each um, pair of, of models um, so so far this is all sounding quite abstract and so I thought I would walk you through a, a fairly intuitive example to show you um, how this uh, sort of problem arises and also how the household fixed effects um, deal with it. So to move away from the world of, of kind of psychology and, and of politics for a second, um, empirically if you look at people's heights and you look at how interested they are in, in uh, highbrow culture, so things like opera, classical music, ballet, and, and so forth, you will find uh, that taller men and taller women are more likely 
to be interested in highbrow culture than people who are shorter. Now, we think it's fairly unlikely that this is a causal relationship, that being taller somehow makes you more um, interested um, in these things. Rather, it's much more likely that uh, uh, both our, our height and our kind of uh, cultural interests share some common confounding variable, right? And in particular, it's going to share a, a kind of parental socioeconomic um, status factor, right? So if your parents were um, kind of rich uh, when you were growing up, you're more likely to grow up in a, an environment where there was no uh, sort of uh, food shortages, you weren't exposed to um, environmental toxins and so forth, uh, and so you're more likely to grow up tall. And if you grew up in that sort of affluent environment, you're also much more likely to be socialized into kind of highbrow culture. So you're more likely to be um, uh, kind of interested in things like opera and, and, and ballet and, and, and so forth. And uh, so when we just uh, kind of do a standard cross-section relationship, we will find that taller people are more interested in um, a highbrow culture. But when we uh, look at uh, the differences within each household, which is what fixed effects is essentially doing, We've, you, you can see if taller people within a particular context are more likely to be interested in um, uh, highbrow culture than shorter people within the same household, which if there was a causal relationship of, of height is what you would expect to find. And this is what we're going to do later with personality, right? We're going to look at people within the same household, and if people who are higher in openness within that household uh, are more liberal, then it suggests that there is a causal relationship of um, uh, openness on liberalism. But if there's no difference uh, between people within the same household, it's strongly suggestive that uh, both kind of openness and liberalism are kind of being predicted by a shared kind of contextual characteristic. And so just to show you uh, what this looks like for our, our kind of classical uh, music and opera, etc. Um, example, if you just do in a naive model, you see that indeed, uh, the taller you are, the more likely you are uh, to be interested in uh, highbrow culture. Uh, but if you add the household fixed effects, this relationship obviously um, goes away. So uh, to do this for politics, we also need particular uh, types of data. We need household panel studies, uh, and we also need household panel studies that ask uh, measures of, of personality and also of political attitudes. And so far, we've found um, four different sources, which I'll, I'll talk about um, as I go. Um, but we're still looking for more. So if you happen to know of any more, please, uh, please let me know. Um, the first one is the Understanding Society study, which is done in the UK and has got uh, quite a large uh, sample size uh, and has got an OK, but not not amazing measure of, of, of personality, uh, which uses a 15 item um, scale, so three for each uh, a facet of personality, uh, but unfortunately doesn't have great uh, measures of, of political attitudes. But it did ask about support for Brexit in 2016. And what we find when we run our models is that as you would expect, given the previous literature, people who are high on openness were much less likely to support leaving um, the EU. But importantly, if you add the household fixed effects, this relationship um, goes away. So I'm going to plot all the effects of um, personality so you can see them, but I'm not going to um, uh, talk about them much. You can see that the uh, relationship between conscientiousness and, and, and support for leave does shrink a bit too, um, although it is uh, still slightly there. Uh, but the important one uh, is this this kind of quite dramatic uh, change. So openness goes from being uh, by far the largest effect of personality uh, to being uh, essentially zero. And I'm just going to kind of flick through uh, the uh, other studies because I've been talking um, uh, too long already. Um, so uh, the Understanding America studies, the name suggests, is, is a similar panel conducted in America. Albeit it's much smaller, but it has a much uh, better measure of personality. Uh, but it only has this uh, kind of standard American liberal conservative scale. Uh, but there we find the same relationship. So uh, if you just do the naive approach, you find that along with the previous literature that being high in openness makes you more politically liberal. Uh, but if you add the household fixed effects, this relationship goes away. And if you look at uh, some data from uh, Switzerland, uh, which has a, a kind of quite short measure of personality, uh, but some more interesting uh, kind of political attitude measures, uh, we find the similar sort of thing. So naive approach suggests that uh, being high in openness makes you more left-wing, but this goes away, controlling for uh, household fixed effects. Uh, it also decreases the relationship 
uh, between openness and social spending. Uh, the relationship between openness and EU support for EU membership goes away. Uh, attitudes to immigration and, and foreigners shrinks, as does uh, support for environmentalism and uh, gender equality. And then finally, uh, in uh, the list panel, which comes from the Netherlands, which has a very good measure of personality uh, and also has some very uh, sort of well-measured attitudes that relate to the kind of social uh, dimension of, of, of politics, uh, we can see uh, the same sort of thing. So again, the left-right uh, um, relationship between openness and left-right goes away and attitudes towards things like gender equality shrink. Immigration uh, goes away completely. Attitudes towards kind of traditional marriage uh, uh, sort of values goes uh, goes away, as does uh, kind of attitudes to whether uh, children have obligations towards their parents and so forth, and uh, kind of attitudes towards duty and and, and kind of leisure and, and that sort of thing. So just to very briefly conclude. Across all four of these uh, household panels, we find a very uh, consistent pattern which suggests that uh, the relationship between uh, the openness personality trait and political attitudes is driven by an omitted kind of social and contextual um, confounding uh, variable. And that if we control uh, for this uh, kind of contextual confounding, then uh, the relationship between openness and political liberalism seems to either shrink substantially or, or go away uh, completely. And so we need to kind of radically reconsider the role of, of personality and political behavior. The sort of previous approaches um, might have uh, kind of overestimated the importance of, of personality and underestimated the importance of things like socialization. And we also need to think about this sort of pattern in, in other kind of contexts beyond um, kind of political psychology, because we think this is likely to be something that uh, kind of pops up um, in all sorts of uh, other situations as well. So thank you uh, very much uh, for watching, and I, I look forward to our discussion.